So let us start with a second part of Ben Elias's lecture on categorical diagonalization. Um, please go ahead. All right, thanks again. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I want, I want to start by reviewing some of the stuff that we talked about last time, um, and then try to get into the motivation of some of the constructions, and then go to the application to the Heck algebra. Um, so just this is sort of the big uh, linear algebra review. Um, the theorem we were trying to, cate uh, to categorify was the fact that if you have an operator such that this polynomial vanishes, um, this standard polynomial product of uh, f minus eigenvalue, then in fact uh, the vector space splits into eigenspaces. Um, and so to do that, you actually have to construct um, a projection map to each eigenspace, satisfying the standard properties that projection map should have. And you want this projection map, um, in fact, the projection map is a polynomial in f. Um, and that sort of motivates how you should uh, categorify it by categorifying the polynomial. Um, so last time in the categorical, in the categorification of this setting, we work with um, uh, a monoidal category, which is triangulated, um, where there's a, some sort of compatibility between the tensor product structure and the structure of cones. Um, one situation where this always works is in the, say, uh, homotopy category of an additive monoidal category. And so just for sake of, um, you need a couple other things about this triangulated category. Let's just always stick with homotopy categories so we don't make any, have to make any complicated statements about triangulated categories and so forth. Um, we have an, a functor, or in other words, an object in this monoidal category, um, which is the thing which we're going to try to diagonalize. And we've got some eigenvalues, which would be scalar objects, things that look like shifts of the monoidal identity. Um, so what's new in the categorification, oh, did this not update? There it is. It's a little bit uh, laggy today. Um, what's new in the categorification is this uh, relationship between the eigenvalue and the operator, this thing we call an eigenmap. Um, and sort of an eigenobject would be something for which lambda m and fm are isomorphic, but the lambda map is what's giving you that isomorphism in sort of a functorial way. So m is called an alpha eigenobject if when I take the eigenmap and apply it to m, um, I get an isomorphism from scalar times m to f times m. And the set of all eigenobjects form a nice full subcategory, which I'm going to call the eigencategory, um, which I'm going to usually index by uh, lambda, the eigenvalue, although if sometimes eigenvalues can overlap, um, at which point I might index it by the eigenmap instead. Um, and then so you can take the cone of this map. If we're in a triangulated category, you could take the cone. And um, for this map to be an isomorphism is the same as saying that its cone is zero. So the eigen category happens to be precisely those objects which are killed by the cone. And that's just like saying an eigenvector is killed by f minus lambda times the identity. Um, I'm just going to remind you of the main example. If A is the group algebra of uh, Zima Tuzi, um, then we can make this uh, fun complex um, of A modules which is actually quasi-isomorphic to the trivial representation. And we can let um, one of the eigenmaps be that quasi-isomorphism, and we can let the other eigenmap be the inclusion of the identity with this homological ship. And it's not so hard to find um, eigenobjects for this thing. So f times a is isomorphic to a shift of a by 0. We did that computation last time. Um, now, if you take the cones of these maps, this is what it looks like. Um, after doing some Gaussian elimination to cross off extra identity terms that cancel when I take the cone of this map. Um, and, um, and it turns out that in fact, uh, these, um, so in fact, A is an eigenobject for this eigenmap. So this map does induce an isomorphism after tensoring with A. Um, and consequently, a is killed by this eigen cone. Meanwhile, this eigen cone is built out of A, and so when I tensor them together, I get zero. Um, each eigen cone is, in fact, an eigen object for the other eigen map. In this case, because there's only two eigen values. Ben, sorry, can you remind us the difference between A and the underlined? Ah, the underline indicates homological degree zero mm -hmm. in a complex. Thank you. Um, so, yes. Are there any plus minus typos in that? 
Are there any plus minus typos? Any x squared plus one and both maps have an x minus one? Um, so, uh, so certainly if I kill x minus one, then x acts by one. So that's what I want to kill to get down to the trivial rep for sure. But do you want to define A as a quotient by the ideal x squared plus one or minus one? Oh yeah, that should definitely be x squared minus one. You are correct. Absolutely right. All right. I'll make that black in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, th this is an example of a pre-diagonalizable operator. So we have a bunch of cones and if you take the tensor product of the cones, you get zero. We just saw that in the example, and that categorifies the, this minimum, this polynomial vanishing. Um, so now we want to construct these projection maps. We want to prove the theorem to say that if you're pre-diagonalizable, then in fact you're diagonalizable. You split in some sense into eigen categories. So, sorry, um, just to remind us in this example, the tensor product, the order of the tensor product doesn't matter. It's going in this to example, the order of the tensor product doesn't matter, and uh, we're going to stick entirely with examples where the order of the tensor product doesn't matter, but you can handle situations where the order does matter just by saying it, the tensor product is zero in all possible orders. Um, this would be a hard thing to prove, though. I don't know how useful that is. It would be hard to come up with an example where you could prove that easily. So you don't have good examples where things are zero in one order but not in the other? Yeah, we don't. Um, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you I mean, what I'm going to say later on in this talk is why this theorem is useful. In other words, how do you actually prove that you can have a bunch of tensor products of cones, which is zero? Like, how can you effectively use this theorem? Um, and so uh, in the proof that I'm going to give, actually, it's a very specific order that makes it obviously zero. And the other orders aren't obviously zero. So having some theorem about that tells you when they commute is actually really useful. <laughs> we do have a criterion for when these cones commute. But I'm leaving that out. Okay, um, so to, to categorify this polynomial, um, projection was built up by taking a product of these individual factors, C lambda mu. So C lambda mu is built out of, cop, out of F minus lambda, which kills the lambda eigenspace. But because of the denominator, it fixes the mu eigenspace and it preserves the other eigenspaces. Um, our first step was to rewrite this as a power series. Um, and then we categorified the power series by taking sort of some iterated cone or some convolution of other complexes. So I was just, this is the sort of picture for what this giant, you should visualize this as just a recipe for constructing a giant complex out of little pieces. Each, each individual piece here is a complex perhaps. Um, and each of these is a chain map. And, and, and uh, you can glue these together into one giant total complex. Now, this complex is built up out of copies of um, the cone of alpha lambda, so it should kill things that, alpha, that, that this cone kills. Um, so consequently, this, this thing should kill the lambda eigenspace. Also, it's mostly built out of cones of alpha mu as well. Um, the cone of alpha mu and the cone of minus alpha mu are actually isomorphic, and the sign is only there for technical reasons. You could just ignore it in your mind. Um, so, all of these terms should act on the mu eigenspace as zero, and f should act on the mu eigenspace as mu, and mu inverse should act on the mu eigenspace as mu inverse, so this thing should act as the identity on the mu eigenspace. Um, and, uh, and so you can see that this thing should satisfy basically the same properties categorified that the, that the operator did downstairs. Um, just wanted to remind you what this looked like in our example. Um, in our example, you take the cone of alpha lambda and you take infinitely many copies and then you link them by alpha mu's. Um, and when you Gaussian eliminate, because the alpha mu's are isomorphisms, all the ones disappear and you get this nice complex. Okay. Um, so we use this power series um, in a particular uh, a particular order because if you have, say, two invertible eigenvalues uh, and their homological shifts are distinct and you've decided that you're going to work once and for all in the bounded above triangulated category, you need some sort of some setting where you can take tensor products. So you can't just take complexes unbounded in both directions. You need to be able to take tensor products nicely 
let's stick to bounded above complexes. Um, well, if you make it so that the homological shift of mu is bigger than lambda, then when you divide by it, you have something with a negative shift. And so if you keep um, taking powers of this, you get successively more and more negative shifts. And that's sort of the reason why such a complex might converge um, in the bounded above category. Whereas if you were trying to use the same formula for C mu lambda, and you tried to express it in the power series of mu over lambda, you'd have successively positive shifts, and we don't want to do that. So we had this other way of categorifying C mu lambda, um, and we basically just used uh, a power series still in lambda over mu. But it, this can be sort of pretty compactly drawn by taking what we had before, I included the mu inverse inside, and adding a one at the beginning. So in one case, you get a complex that goes off to infinity to the left, and in the other case, it goes off to infinity to the right, or it just no, stays in the same place? No, this also goes off to the infinity to the left. All we did is we took this previous complex that we had here, say, and put an extra copy of the identity on top. Um, so uh, the point is that if we tried to use this definition to define C mu lambda, it would go off to the right. We're using a different definition to define C mu lambda so that we can stay in the same, um, in the same world of bounded above complexes. Um, so basically we use the fact that C mu lambda is actually one minus C lambda mu um, and uh, to motivate this construction that we, that we um, just take a cone of an extra map. Now you can see this is built out of copies of alpha mu um, and so it should kill the mu eigenspace and, and so forth. It should satisfy everything you want to say. Um, so in, again, in this example, um, here are the two uh, uh, C operators, and they have this distinguished triangle where there's sort of a projection map from the top to the bottom, and the kernel of that map is, is, um, is the identity. However, the projection map is a built-in homological shift. So here's the projection map, the kernel is the identity, and you get this distinguished triangle. Um, in this example, by the way, there's only two eigenvalues, so the C operator is in fact the projection to the eigenspace. Okay, so here's our theorem stated in a slightly, you know, in not the most general setting that we could, of course, but this, this will do. Um, so we're gonna stick with the, ad, with the homotopy category of an additive monoidal category. We're gonna take a functor and assume that we've picked a bunch of eigenmaps where the eigenvalues are invertible and have distinct homological degrees. So this is already like a really specific thing. How many, uh, you, you don't expect so many uh, functors to be diagonalized um, with these nice properties. And we suppose that it satisfies this minimal polynomial condition. The tensor product of the cones is zero. Um, if so, then I just told you how to construct these uh, complexes, C mu lambda and C lambda mu. And we can let P mu be the tensor product of all the C lambda mu's for lambda not equal to mu. And then we categorify all the statements that we would want from linear algebra. There's some way to construct the monoidal identity as a sort of uh, convolution built up out of these pieces, which are P lambdas. Um, they're orthogonal when lambda is not equal to mu. Um, putting these together, you can tensor P lambda with the identity and you should get P lambda, but all the other factors in this twisted differential vanish and you just get P lambda times P lambda. Um, and finally, also, P lambda is built up out of copies of uh, the cone lambda mu tensor stuff. And so it should also kill the mu eigenspace. Um, so as you'd expect from linear algebra, uh, as you'd expect from linear algebra, projection to the one eigenspace kills the other eigenspace. I mentioned this because that's not always true categorically, even if you have all the other conditions. But if, if, you, if, you're, if you've constructed your projection maps in the way that we have, um, then you get what's called a tight diagonalization, where projection to one eigenspace kills the other eigenspace, so that eigenspaces are, in fact, perpendicular. They, they, they intersect trivially. OK. Um, that's, our, that, that's our main uh, diagonalization theorem. And as you can see, it's pretty limited. And I'll talk about what it takes to maybe extend it um, in you know, an ideal world later on. Um, so 
the proof of this is is you've already seen actually almost everything. I'm 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 not gonna spend any time on it really. I just want to say, step one is come up with these constructions that I that I already tried to show you and give you examples of. Um, step two is to argue that in fact um, p p mu is a is a mu eigenvector um, because it's sort of built from all these other things and. Each of these is, is built from a copy of one of the other eigencombs. Um, so the projector is built from a tensor product of all but one of the eigencombs. And so when I tensor it with the last one, I should get something which is zero by this minimal polynomial condition that the tensor product of all of them is zero. Um, so then you show orthogonality, but sort of the only thing that's really interesting in this proof, I guess, is 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 two things. Um, one is that you have to know that all this homological stuff I'm saying makes sense. I'm saying a lot of things, oh, this complex is built out of copies of this complex. And if I, a, 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 and all these ideas aren't um, automatic. You need sort of uh, you, some sufficient properties of everything that you're doing. And this is why it's so important that our tensor products are well-defined um, using direct sums and not say products or anything. You need the infinite direct sums to equal infinite direct products when you take tensor products. It's kind of an obnoxious technical point. Um, the only interesting feature. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that just one question? So when you have two eigenvalues, lambda and mu, mm -hmm. for the identity function, you have two decompositions as a cone of map from. No, they're really from ordered. From they're in one direction. You they're, have two really decompositions of identity using map oh. in p lambda and p mu and back, or, or not, or just one? You just have one. If you're in k minus, so like, if you're in K minus, the fact that one is in homological degree smaller than the other puts a real order on these mm -hmm. eigenvalues. So you have to sort of have an order on this eigen, eigenvalues. Now, if you're in K plus, if you're working with bounded below complexes, that does reverse the order. Um, okay, but you need an order. You need an order on eigenvalues. That's right. That's one of these new things that appears in the categorification. Anyway, I just want to like, say very quickly and whatever, the only sort of thing that you haven't been exposed to in this proof is sort of how you build up this filtration of the identity by the projectors. And it's really just some clever combinatorics. Sort of, you know for every pair, lambda and mu, not e lambda not equal to mu, that the identity is the cone of this map by construction. And so you can take a tensor product over all pairs to get this enormous cube of size, two to the n choose two which is like a huge thing, but where many, but it's quite sparse. And then you have to find like sub cubes inside this that fit together to be the projectors in the way that you want it to. So this is some fun little combinatorial uh, gadget. And, and, you know, it's not, I haven't seen this anywhere else and I haven't seen any other applications for it, but that's sort of all that's missing in the proof. And I just want to ignore it and move on. Okay, here. Now we're going to get to, so you can start paying attention again. Um, where did this construction of C lambda mu come from? How did we pull this out of our hat? More, more interestingly, like the goal is to sort of categorify a denominator. Remember that C lambda mu was, was just given by um, F minus lambda over mu minus lambda and sort of all that we were doing was finding some way to deal with this denominator in a categorical set. We turned it into a power series and turned the power series into an infinite complex, but where did that idea come from? Actually, Christopher's asking if the number of eigenvalues is finite. The number of eigenvalues is finite. That's, that's, in it. that's correct. I uh, somehow, uh, let me get my chat up there. Okay, good. Um, so where did this construction come from? It comes from, it's motivated and it really comes from causal duality. Just the easiest case of causal duality that you learn first, polynomials in the exterior algebra. So let R be the polynomial ring in one variable and lambda be the exterior algebra in one variable. And both of these have trivial representations, have one dimensional modules um, where you kill sort of the unique graded ideal, maximal graded ideal. Um, I want to just quickly just, I wanted to be able to distinguish between these two one dimensional modules. So I'm going to call this the one dimensional module over R and this is the one dimensional module over the exterior algebra. 
Okay, so each of these modules are not projective, but they have projective resolutions. And this is what the projective resolutions look like. Your projective resolution of R, uh, of CR, just has two copies of R. And your projective resolution of C lambda has infinitely many copies of lambda. This should be something that you've hopefully seen before at some point in your life. These two examples of projective resolutions are pretty classic. So one way to think about this, and, and here's the idea of causal duality said in a nutshell, is that um, to construct the projective resolution of CR, we take two copies of, of, of R and we glue them together in a, in a, into a complex in a, in a configuration that looks like how you build the exterior algebra. The exterior algebra is two copies of C linked by D. Whereas to construct the um, exterior algebra, the, the, the um, projective resolution of C lambda, you take infinitely many copies of lambda, link them together, but that looks like a copy of the polynomial ring. Um, so you glue these copies together in, in a polynomial ring configuration. Um, now, if you're like really paying attention, uh, it's not the polynomial ring. In, in the polynomial ring, x has infinite order. It's not nilpotent. It goes on forever. Whereas in this thing, x seems to be locally nilpotent. It seems to eventually stop and terminate. And that's because you're really taking a dual vector space and the, uh, the dual operator. So there's some sort of also dual vector spaces showing up here. You can't see that when you're just talking about what a basis looks like. Um, but, but so um, the upshot of this is that uh, the exterior algebra is actually the self-extension algebra of CR to itself, and the polynomial ring is actually the self-extension of C lambda to itself. So this, when this happens, uh, you, you have a setting called causal duality. Um, so in fact, everything is graded, and gradings are going to be slightly important for us when we are trying to think about what's happening in the growth index group. So um, let's uh, suppose that say the degree of x is one and q is sort of the corresponding grading shift corresponding to the degree of x. I can sort of write this complex if I want to make it homogeneous so that one is in degree zero in the, in the trivial rep, one is in degree zero. Well then if multiplication by x is homogeneous, one has to be in degree minus one. Um, uh, uh, sorry, so one has to be in degree plus one so that one can go to x. So is this degree different from the homological degree? This yes, this is a graded degree. I'm putting graded degrees oh, on so it. It's not homological degree. It's not homological degree. Um, and similarly, T is going to be the degree of this operator D. So in the growth in the group, now the homological degree matters. In the growth in the group, you take, my, uh, you take the Euler characteristic of a complex. So that the Euler characteristic of, of, of the projective resolution of CR is a one minus QR, one minus Q. Um, this is the thing in homological degree zero and that's in homological degree minus one. So the Euler characteristic of um, a trivial wrap over the exterior algebra is this power series um, in lambda, which is one over one plus T. And we see right there a denominator of here. 1 over 1 plus t, a denominator sort of naturally appears in this example. Um, so conversely, um, you can think, instead of working with projective resolutions, you can think that these uh, objects themselves have um, filtrations where the subquotients are simple. In other words, you're choosing a basis since the, since the simple is one-dimensional. So I can think that R has a graded filtration um, by the ideals of one x, x squared, x cubed, and so forth. And um, in the associated graded, you get copies of CR, so that R is built up in this way out of copies of CR. This is its quote unquote Jordan Holder filtration. I know it's infinite. Um, and the Jordan Holder filtration of lambda is two copies of C lambda. So these two different ways of viewing it are completely compatible with each other. Right, if CR is equal to one minus QR, which we argued with projective resolutions, while R is one over one minus QCR, we argued by choosing a basis, okay? So these ideas go back and forth with each other. Okay, I mean, I'm just recording these ideas up top. And now I'm gonna sort of head to the setting a question. We wanted to categorify 
f minus lambda over c minus lambda. Or in other words, after normalizing a little bit, we wanted to categorify f minus lambda over 1 minus lambda over mu. Um, so now we know how to categorify the numerator. So there's some object m that we already have that categorifies the numerator. And we want to categorify m over 1 minus z for some, for some sort of shift z. So how might we do that? Well, analogy one is to think about things in the world of R modules. Okay, so what's the analogy here? M is like the trivial rep. And um, C then should be like um, the polynomial ring itself. Because when I take trivial rep, right, right over here, here it is, trivial rep over one minus Q is polynomial. So um, we, we want sort of to think about C as being like the polynomial ring and M as being its one dimensional module. So how do we build R out of CR? Well, we know that we've got sort of this filtration with one dimensional pieces. We know we take infinitely many copies of the trivial rep and then we link them by multiplication by X, okay? So we want some sort of object with an infinite filtration whose associated gradient is infinitely many copies of M. And when we're done, we expect this thing that we constructed to have a free action of the polynomial ring. This is a structure that we haven't explored yet, but actually is present in the categorification. So if you look at this complex C lambda mu, which we constructed, this sort of two periodic sequence of A's followed by the identity. Um, and we look at its corresponding shift by Q, which is the lambda over mu, or, or shift by homological degree two, we see that in fact, there is a map from the shift to lambda mu, um, which sort of records the periodicity of this complex. So we sort of just include everything by the identity and we use an eigenmap to link the last term. So, there is a map X, which you should think of as the operator inside the polynomial ring, which is acting on our complex as an endomorphism. And you can see that if you take the cone of this, you sort of cross off all the isomorphisms and you just keep this final segment right here. Um, you keep just this final segment, which is the cone that we are interested in. So it's again true that R goes by X to R, is a resolution of this cone. Um, similarly, uh, in, in, if we do the flip side and do the other example of the other cone, it's constructed in a completely different, it's a constructed in a not completely different, but in a different way, but it still has this uh, periodicity map X. Okay, so like, and if you were drawing this in the abstract way, um, um, with this recipe for building it up as an iterated cone, this is, this is what it looks like. So um, analogy one, metaphor one, that we wanted to sort of, sorry, we wanted to think about M as, as being the trivial rep of R and C as being the, the regular rep of R, so that C should have an action of R, and you take the cone of X and you get back the trivial rep. And that was true in our example. Um, but there's this, but there's cultural duality, which means that there's always two signs to every coin. And so now let's think about it from the other perspective. Let's think of it from the perspective of the exterior algebra. So if we want to categorify, oops, sorry. If we want to categorify M over one minus Z, well, here's sort of our perspective here. M should be now the free module over the exterior algebra. And this fraction C should be the trivial rep. Okay. So M is like the free algebra, and we're trying to build C, which is the trivial rep, out of this. How do we build the trivial rep out of the free module? We take this projective resolution. So we take infinitely many copies again, and we link them by operators D. And then we take the total complex of that. In order to do this, M needs to be a module over lambda so that there's an operator d such that d squared is zero and i can make this infinite complex and again this is another piece of structure that we haven't really explored so we should find an endomorphism of the cone of the eigen cone we should find an endomorphism d such that d squared is zero 
and we should use it to build this infinite resolution. Okay, so here's M. Here's the appropriate shift of M, such that um, such that the map D should have de this degree. And lo and behold, our map D is just the other eigenmap. Okay, so D sends the sort of scalar part of this cone into the F part of the cone. And if I square it, the F, it sends the F part of the cone to zero. So if I square it, it sends this to the F part and the F part to zero and the D squared is zero. So this is a way to construct uh, um, a, a, uh, a map D, an automorphism, uh, endomorphism of the cone for which D squared is zero. And if you glue infinitely many copies together, this is exactly our construction of C lambda. Okay, so in some sense, we're doing causal duality between the polynomial ring and the exterior algebra, not for the trivial rep, but for some other um, module over lambda. So this eigencone is in fact a lambda module in, in, in complexes. Okay, so the punchlines here are that is that the eigencone is a lambda module where we use the other eigencone to construct this act, to, to give you the module structure. And what we're really doing to construct C out of the cone is we're sort of taking the derived tensor product with the trivial rep, which is to say we're sort of tensoring with the projective resolution of the trivial rep. Um, but also we can think of it because the exterior algebra of, because the X algebra of itself is R, that makes this, this tensor product into an R module as well. Because R sort of acts on this thing in, der in a derived sense. And that R module structure can be observed in this sort of map recording the, the, the periodic construction of C lambda. Um, said another way, you can reconstruct the cone from C lambda mu by sort of taking the taking the derived tensor product of C lambda, which is just another way of saying take this take this um, take this uh, take the cone of this periodicity map, just take the projective resolution and take the total complex of that. So these are some really cool homological tricks. But they're probably new to almost everyone. They were new to me. Um, we invented C lambda mu before we came up with this perspective of how to how to think about it, um, and then and then and then Matt Hogan Camp sits and ponders for a while and comes up with this kind of perspective. That's the kind of thing he's kind of amazing at. Um, but this perspective sort of really illustrates how you might have come up with this um, yourself if you were trying to come up with a way to categorify uh, a denominator. Well, the exterior algebra gives you sort of the first really visible denominator that you probably encounter. So try to try to try to use that to its best effect. Um, oh, again, this is actually a completely general construction you could apply to any complex that, that's actually a lambda module. So similarly, um, P mu is just a tensor product of a whole bunch of copies of, uh, of these C lambda mu's. Um, and in fact, so if there's R plus one eigenvalues, then there's sort of R tensor factors here. And each one of them has an action of some operator X. So in fact, there's a whole polynomial ring acting on this tensor product. Um, and you can actually think that this P mu is built up out of a tensor product of all but one of the cones in the same way using causal duality for a polynomial ring in R variables instead of a polynomial ring in one variable. In particular, it does have this polynomial ring acting on it by sort of, uh, Sort of periodicity maps in different quad in different directions, like the x-axis or the y-axis. Um, and um, this whole construction, as I as I've been trying to emphasize, only works when you start with invertible scalar functors, because what you're trying the denominator you're trying to divide by is is one plus something invertible. What if instead we wanted to 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 diagonalize the Casimir operator. And in, in the first talk, I gave you this Casimir operator, and I said it's a motivating goal to try to find a way to diagonalize this thing categorically. The problem is that its eigenvalues are not invertible. Its eigenvalues are sort of two shifts 
uh, it's a direct sum of two shifts. So it's a direct sum of two invertible functors. And so what we would want to, what we'd want to divide by, the denominator we'd want to divide by looks something like this. So I've never seen this sort of thing appear in normal homological algebra as sort of the multiplicity of, of, uh, of a projective resolution of something. But if you can find a pair of causal algebras um, for which uh, the, you know, the, the graded dimension of the X algebra, sort of it, the bi-graded dimension describes this uh, power series, chances are you could use this to give some sort of general construction where you would take the eigen cone or whatever the appropriate notion is, figure out what structure it has, and then, and then um, glue, it to get, glue together a whole bunch of copies to construct C lambda mu. So this is sort of, uh, we're, we're, a certain, we're at a loss right now, but, if, but uh, this is sort of a, a great place to try to explore, to see what other sort of causal algebras you can find and what it means to have a complex with an action of that causal algebra on it, what that would let you do. So um, I think this is definitely a, an interesting area for, for further exploration. Any questions about that? Um, I'm gonna skip my next topic and move straight on to uh, what I'm what I'm skipping is some absolutely beautiful stuff of Gorski and Nagutz Rasmussen, uh, Gorski and Nagutz Rasmussen, um, which is sort of connecting what's happening here to projective space, coherent sheaves on projective space. Um, so this is like an absolutely utterly beautiful theory that you all should read, um, but I want to get to the Hecke algebra. And so I only have so much time, I'm sorry. All right, um, back to the thing that I was saying in the first talk. Diagonalization is useful. Um, I motivated it by saying that you could project to eigenspaces of representations. Um, well, I wanna say that our diagonalization theorem is useful. Um, so I wanna convince you that it's possible to apply it in, in, in some circumstance. And how would you go about, if you were given a, something that you expected to be diagonalizable, how would you find all these eigenmaps? It seems like a lot of structure that you have to actually construct. And even if you did, how would you prove that the tensor product of the cones is zero? And it seems like some giant tensor product you'd have, to, uh, you'd have to compute, you'd have to Gaussian eliminate it, and that seems terrible. So I'm, I'm gonna try to explain to you in an example how this comes to be. But first I want to do an example, so I wanna tell you about the heck algebra. So here's the group algebra of the symmetric group um, with its Coxeter presentation. Uh, this should be fairly um, familiar, I hope, to many of you. You have um, the simple reflections, uh, i, i plus one, and you have, um, and, and they satisfy the braid relations. Um, so that's a quotient of the group algebra of the braid group by a quadratic relation that says that si squared is one. And the Heck algebra deforms this. It adds a new invertible parameter v. And instead of the generator having eigenvalues one and minus one, the generator has eigenvalues minus v and the v inverse. So that's the Heck algebra. It's very similar to the symmetric group. Um, but Adding this V allows you to come up with this sort of new generator. So this BI, which is HI plus V, is called the kajdan lustig generator. And if you specialize V back to one, you get the symmetric group. So you should think this is like one plus S. What if you took the group algebra and instead of using generators SI, you use generators one plus SI? What would you get? Well, you'd end up with a slightly different presentation that looks like this. Um, uh, so instead of this braid relation up here, you'd have this thing, which is kind of like a braid relation, but with some lower terms. You would end up with a nice commuting relation on the nose, and this is the sort of replacement quadratic relation. So one plus S has eigenvalues zero and two, instead of minus one and one. And here the eigenvalues are zero and quantum two. So it's sort of a standard theorem. Um, you can prove it with a, a variety of ways. There's a new proof of the Bergman diamond lemma that I like, um, that the Heck algebra has a standard basis indexed by elements of the symmetric group. So it's sort of a flat deformation of the symmetric group. It has the same size. 
Um, but Kajdan Lustig did something really interesting. They constructed a, a different basis of it, the Kajdan Lustig basis, VW, and they were highly motivated by categorification. So uh, in modern language, there is this category, the Hecke category, a nice additive monoidal Peruvian graded category. Um, and its growth in the group is isomorphic to the Hecke algebra. And its growth in the group is equipped with the natural basis given by the symbols of the indecomposable objects. So I'm gonna call the indecomposable objects in this categorification BW. There's one for each element of the symmetric group up to isomorphism and grading shift. And it turns out that what they categorify is the kajdan lusti basis, not the standard basis. So, um, so this is sort of the more interesting basis uh, that you're forced to work with when you're doing categorification. Again, categorification doesn't let you mess around with your basis. You are stuck with a particular basis. And if you're doing characteristic zero, perverse sheaves, uh, whatever, uh, it's this basis. So here's the heck algebra. I'm not gonna be able to tell you anything basically about the categorification and how it's constructed and the details of it because I'm, I'm focusing on something else. Um, so let me just tell you now about the representation theory of the Heck algebra. We know that the irreducible representations are in bijection with permutation, partitions of M. Uh, here's three ways to construct this. So here's Speck's original construction of the module associated to a, a, a partition. You have the symmetric group acting on a polynomial ring and N variables. And to a partition, I can associate sort of uh, any any tableau that you want, any any tableau whatsoever that you want. I just did sort of the standard column reading tableau, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a tableau is where you put numbers in the boxes. And then you take the product of all uh, xi minus xj for all things in the same column. So x1 minus x2, x1 minus x3, x2 minus x3, x4 minus x5, x6 minus x7. And we'll call this pi lambda, or really, pi sub t, it depends on your tableau, but for the standard column reading tableau, that's fine. And then you take the orbit of this thing under the action of the symmetric group, which sort of just permutes where you put the numbers. And you take the span of this inside the polynomial ring. That is the spec module. That is a really elementary construction. Um, that's a really nice thing. You can do this over the integers if you want. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned this, it's, it's not obvious how this version will deform to the Heck algebra. Um, by the way, I love to study the ideal generated by this V lambda in the polynomial ring. This is sort of, I don't think it's well enough studied. Here is the second construction. It's called Young Seminormal Form. And basically it, it pins down a, a um, particular basis of this representation, indexed by standard Young tableau. So standard Young tableau is a way to put numbers in the boxes such that they always increase when you go to the right and increase when you go down. So here's an example of a standard Young tableau of shape lambda. And there's explicit rules then. So you pick this basis index by tableau and then there's rules for how each of the generators act on it. But what's great about this basis is that it's a eigenbasis, excuse me. So the Heck algebra is a quotient of the braid group by this quadratic relations. I like to talk about the break group instead of the heck algebra just because it's easier to visualize what's going on. So the crossings are what go to these generators, the crossings in the break group. And the break group has these nice positive elements called the young uses Murphy elements, which take the ice strand and wrap them around the previous strands. And YJM1 is actually the identity. Um, YJM1, YJM2, YJM3, these things all commute with each other because this, this thing will commute with anything that happens to the first I minus one strands. So you have this big commutative family, uh, sub algebra of the braid group um, generated by the young uses Murphy elements. And this thing is gonna be simultaneously diagonalizable. You should think of this as the analog in the Heck algebra of the Cartan sub algebra. So when I talk about YJMI, I could mean this element of the braid group or I could mean the image in the Heck algebra. And it turns out that these ETs are a simultaneous eigenbasis for, for the YJMs. So the eigenvalue of YJMI is V to the twice the content of the ith box. 
So the content is which diagonal you're on. So YJM3 has eigenvalue V squared, as does YJM8. YJM2 has eigenvalue V to the minus 2. Now there's this nice element called the full twist, which is the product of all the YJMs, each of them once. It happens to be central in the braid group. It also happens to be the square of the half twist, which is what happens when you take your fingers and you just flip your hand over. So the full twist is doing that. And um, since it's the product of all the YJMIs, you take the sum of all the contents of all the boxes, which doesn't depend on what tableau you chose. So it's independent of the tableau. It just depends on the lambda. And that's the content. That's the eigenvalue of the full twist, which acts by a scalar on this whole representation. Meanwhile, here's construction three. So Robinson Shenstead proved uh, that there's a bijection between the symmetric group and triples of a partition and two tableau of that shape. Have you never seen Robinson Shenstead before? It's funky. Um, but here's what it looks like for the symmetric group S3. Just to give you an example. Sorry, I'm seeing some questions. Oh, good. Um, and um, elements that have the same lambda are called two-sided cells, which you can see visually here in green. Elements with the same lambda and the same P symbol are called right cells, and elements with the same Q are called left cells. So here they are. Now, it's worth noting that partitions are, have a dominance order. So this thing is minimal in the dominance order, and this thing is maximal in the dominance order. And there's an order on partitions. So Kazan and Wustig proved that if you take the span of the things in one cell and every lower cell, you actually get an ideal. So in fact, this is a two-sided ideal. Say everything but the identity forms a two-sided ideal. And if you do left cells, so this thing and this thing and this thing span a left, left ideal. And these three would span a right ideal. Okay? So they showed that ideals um, spanned by, are, are, are spanned by certain Kajdanustic elements. What's the point of ideals? Ideals give you representations. H acts on an ideal, or H acts on the quotient by an ideal. Um, skipping some stuff, because I'm short on time. So um, one way to construct the spec module is as sort of a, um, as a subquotient of one uh, of one of these ideals, left ideals, by another one. So um, let's see. What can I do in two minutes? Um, let's see what I can do. So these cells are actually asking the question that if you have a basis, an ideal spanned by a subset of your basis, and you contain one basis element, do you also contain another basis element? This gives you a sort of a partial order kind of on basis elements. Um, and, then, um, and then you can, the equivalence classes under this are the cells. But you might be asking, why in God's name would you ever consider such a thing? This is maybe a really weird, unmotivated idea. Why would I care about ideals spanned by basis elements? Um, um, oh, shoot. I did skip what I wanted to say. Um, so cell theory is the study of ideals spanned by basis elements. And um, the whole point is that this immediately categorifies the sort of tensor ideals in a monoidal category. I definitely spent too much time on something that I apologize. Let me see what I can say in one minute that is the most useful. Here we go. Um, do, 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 do. Cell theory, cell theory, cell theory, cell theory. OK. So any element of an, of an algebra will act uh, to preserve an ideal. So you have this filtration of the algebra by ideals corresponding to the cells, and any algebra, any element of the algebra has to act upper triangularly 
on, on this filtration. So any algebra acts, any element of the algebra acts like this. If F is diagonalizable, you expect to see its eigenvalues in cell modules. And eigenvectors should all be things of the form something in cell lambda plus something in smaller cells. So in particular, um, when S acts on it, it acts by a particular eigenvalue and then preserves whatever's in smaller cells. And S minus lambda, or S minus kappa lambda, will send something in cell lambda to something in strictly smaller cells. So if F has a block upper triangular matrix and acts on each cell by an eigenvalue, then this product is automatically zero. You can see that it's zero things on the diagonal blocks. So said another way, um, you should think that F minus the eigenvalue of cell sends each cell to smaller cells. So if you started the identity, it gets sent to a smaller cell, which is then sent to a smaller cell, which is sent to a smaller cell, which is sent to a smaller cell. Eventually, it's sent to the bottom cell, which is sent to zero, and everything kills, is everything is dead. Um, this notion completely categorifies. Um, so if you take the full twist and tensor with an object, you add, so the full twist categorifies to a complex, and when you tensor it with an object, you get you act on it by an eigenvalue, and you get a whole bunch of stuff in lower cells. And the eigen map is sort of picking up just this last term, so that when you tensor with the cone of the eigen map, you instead get something in strictly lower cells. And this is a way to prove that the tensor product of all the cones is zero because it sends one cell to lower cells successfully. Okay, I'm very sorry, I'm gonna shut up. Thank you. <laughs> I should have gone for three hours, four hours. <laughs> very sorry. So, so, right, so again, so you're able to, so, so HT. So HT is the half twist, which. What, what is HT? Just, HT is the half twist. So it's the rookie yeah. complex for the yeah. half twist. Um, so. What is, I do want to say one thing. I said that the full twist acts on cell lambda by eigenvalue V to the two X lambda. There's a beautiful result of, of uh, Graham and then Mathis and then Lustig um, that if you take the half twist and act on cell lambda, then it actually acts by a sign and by some sort of Schutzenberger twist. Um, so when you square the half twist, what you're doing is acting by V to the twice the content and minus one to the twice the column number. So the eigenvalue of the full twist is actually not V to the twice the content. It's V to the twice the content minus one to the twice the column number. And this is what categorifies to a homological shift as well. Um, but you should, you, like, there is already this homological shift, which is usually kind of invisible in the gross index group, is actually visible somewhere. Hmm. Ben, can I ask you, so could you uh, just as a short review illustrate your ideas <clears throat> by using an example of uh, coherent sheaves on a projective space, let's say P1 equivariant with respect to C star action. So, so the, if you want to see this done really well, of course, this is sort of what, what's done in sort of in two of the chapters of the gorski Nigutz rasmussen paper. Um, so this is really well done there, but um, 
so may, may say, um, so you consider coherent sheaves on P1 equivariant with respect to C star, which pushes everything from North Pole to South Pole. And uh, you I prefer to do a covariant under a torus, but that's okay. Sorry? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, yeah, that's which, which would, okay. which would so maybe Borel. So we, th this would select North Pole and South Pole as special points. So you know we're doing P1. Yes, yes, yes. So right. then you would consider a tensoring with O1, and you want to diagonalize that. Mm -hmm. So you know that your eigenobjects are skyscrapers at North Pole and South Pole, and uh, you have your complexes which involve multiplication by X and multiplication by Y. Sure. And when you tensor take tensor product of these two complexes, since X and Y are not simultaneously equal to zero, the whole thing contracts. That's right. So this is, now when, when you talk about cells, your last, your last story, uh, should I understand that a cell in this story would involve, let's say, north, the skyscraper, whatever is generated by skyscraper at the North Pole? That's one cell, and the rest will be the whole, the whole category. That's very, that's, that's very reasonable. Um, again, it's not, like, when I'm talking about cells, I'm talking about something in the Grothendieck group. Um, but so, but it, but it does category, it, it, it is roughly this notion, yes. So, so the, when you're talking about cells, you could meet, you're interested in two different things. You're either interested in the cell module, which is a sub quotient, or you're interested in sort of the cell ideal, which is a, a sub module. Um, and sort of, um, so you could either sort of be interested in just this point or the whole space. That would sort of be the ideals. Or you could be interested in just this point and just this point, which are like the sub quotients. I'm, I'm just trying to get a feeling of uh, your last story about cells. So suppose you have a projective yeah, I, it, state it, it, or, or Grossmanian or partial flag variety okay. with so, so again, the, the, the partial order that you get on eigenvalues is based on some order that you have to choose based on where you're going to expand your, your power series, or in other words, what, um, what homotopy category you're working in. So in this case, you want to sort of allow yourself to take infinite direct sums of things so long as the, the weight shift of the C star action decreases, 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 decreases. And that's sort of giving you sort of an attracting direction that you care about. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's my point. So it's, it somehow reminds me of the envelopes that some other people are studying when you build a family of, when, when you order attracting points, uh, look at who flows where, and uh, you build bigger and bigger um, sub-varieties that are attracted to a certain point. So this, but, this somehow... Okay, but let me, let me just show you this, okay? So this is the full twist on three strands, and you should think of this as O1. Um, and you can sort of see that O1 is sort of built up um, in, in layers out of things in different cells. Um, so how you want to think of this is, I guess, up to you. I don't know. Um, but but um, that you sort of have these um, eigenmaps that sort of pin down what's happening in the lowest homological degree in each cell. Um, the homological degree, this is, this is the part that I'm having trouble. Um, I don't really know how to explain it to you well in this. Um, in this example, in the example of coherent sheaves on projective space. Um, uh, here you would need a full flag variety or maybe Steinberg variety. Perhaps. If, if you want to work with a fine thicket. 